morning. Welcome to uh, Journal Club. Uh, this Dr. Derman, are you going to say something or? Sure, yeah, I'll, I'll kind of introduce the topic for today, which is minimally invasive spine surgery. I selected a handful of articles. We have five articles today that kind of touch upon some of the hotter, interesting topics within the minimally invasive realm, which is really where I, I like to practice. And I think that, you know, the articles themselves are interesting, but they also just bring up some interesting topics that I think will be good fodder for discussion. So the first one that we have um, on the agenda is going to be, they're all going to be um, presented by our fellows. The first one's going to be by Jacob uh, Sequoia Clack, and it's on assessing the difference in uh, clinical and radiographic outcomes between expandable and non-expandable cages among uh, patients undergoing MIS uh, TLIF. It's a systematic review and meta-analysis. So uh, Jacob, you there, you wanna take it away? I am, thank you. Uh, hopefully everyone can hear me. Jacob Sikora Clack here from Texas back. I'm here to present and discuss that assessing the difference in clinical and radiographic outcomes between expandable cages, those undergoing MIS uh, T lifts. This was a systematic review and uh, meta-analysis out of the Mayo Clinic. I do not have any disclosures. And just in general, uh, so the transferaminal lumbar interbody fusion was developed by Dr. Harms after he kind of thought of it as an, maybe an upgrade to the P lift, the PLIF. So you kind of think about uh, decreased neurologic injury, less dural tears, less soft tissue retraction, um, and kind of creating this different corridor through the unilateral laminectomy and inferior facetectomy. Um, this will provide you space into the interbody zone, but a lot of questions kind of remain from it. I mean, how can we improve the coronal and sagittal treatment from this posterior uh, approach? So cue the music. Ah. So then the expandable T-lift cage was developed and um, hopefully questions arose from that to see if they could uh, better align your uh, parameters, both sagittally and coronally. So this study uh, retrospectively looked at uh, MIS T-lifts, tried to compare the literature from expandable alone papers, non-expandable alone, as well as those that compared both. And uh, the inclusion criteria is they had to have at least one outcome of interest. And that was both in terms of patient outcome scores and fusions, as well as radiographic parameters. The exclusion criteria is these couldn't be case reports, case series, or cadaver studies. And when looking for studies, they met 12 uh, studies that met this criteria. So they found about 740 studies, but using these exclusion criteria, um, they were able to narrow it down to just 12. And so in this 12 patient or 12 paper study, they found about 706 eligible patients. 143 had studies just in expandable only cases, as well as the uh, 426 had the non-expandable uh, papers. And then there were 137 patients, which they were able to draw from papers that compared the two. In terms of demographics, this is looking at those 12 studies broken down into three, just the expandable cage use only, non-expandable, expandable versus uh, the non-expandable. So you have sample sizes that range anywhere really from 27 or 20 to 120. Uh, mean age, uh, kind of in that 50s to 60s uh, frame, as well as the follow-up lasted anywhere from uh, approximately 19, or sorry, nine months to about 51. So kind of looking at the results that they pulled together from this data, they found that there was a significant difference in disc height change from their pre-op to post-operative x-rays. In the non-expandable group, they re, uh, gained about 1.3 millimeters of height, whereas in the expandable, a little less at 1.14, which was statistically significant. Going along with that, although maybe counterintuitive, the lumbar lordosis change, they did not find any difference in between the two groups with the non-expandables uh, just slightly, numerically, just slightly higher than the expandable. Please note also the expandable, just in general, had longer follow-up average of about 32 months, whereas the non-expandable had about 15 and a half months. Going into the segmental lordosis change, as the previous one was lumbar lordosis as a whole, the segmental, the expandable cages were proven to be statistically significant higher at 5.04 degrees versus the around 2 degrees for the non-expandable. And then the fusion rates, they, and I apologize for this, that's a typo, there was 0.9 odds ratio in the non-expandable group and a 0.75 odds ratio in the expandable group. 
but ultimately there was no statistically significant difference. So they also looked at subsidence rate. They found that there was a uh, statistically significant difference. They, uh, the expandable uh, was lower than the non-expandable. And then they looked at reoperation rate too, and they found that there was no statistically significant difference in between the expandable and non-expandable. So kind of limitations of the studies, these were all mainly indirect comparisons. The study dates, a lot of the non-expandable cage studies were from around 2008, 2009, earlier from a decade ago. Um, this kind of brings up the change in technology as only one of those non-expandable studies uh, used BMP most, and or all, sorry, used uh, autographed, iliac crest autographed, whereas the newer studies for the expandable trials used BMP and uh, a different technology, as well as they didn't truly have any uh, ODI or VAS or patient reported outcomes. In the introduction of the paper, they talk about the discussion of costs. Are these expandable cages? Uh, because they are more expensive, and uh, is it worth putting them in? And then also follow-up limitations, they were pretty limited. I mean, other than one study that had greater than four years, they were all kind of in the one to two year range, which obviously we would always like more. So I think for discussion, I don't, I don't think that there, uh, the discussion kind of remains the, the change in disc height, but no change in the kind of that segmental lower doses is interesting, as well as the reoperation rates and fusion rates were kind of the same. But I mean, in general, I think this just brings up the discussion, maybe not comparing expandable versus non-expandable, but just in general, have TLIF expandable cages delivered? Do they give you that coronal and sagittal balance change? Uh, Jacob, um, I think that was a good summary of, of the topic here. And, and certainly MIST lift, which is in, in some circles, you know, considered like the pinnacle of an MIS procedure, um, does have limitations in, in what you can do with sagittal balance, et cetera. You know, I th the, the authors of this paper kind of downplayed the importance of that segmental lordosis. Um, but but I, I think that that change in segmental lordosis is important and um, potentially justifies the use of, a, of an implant that can achieve that. You know, if you're doing one or two level degen surgery and the rest of the levels in the, in the lumbar spine are mobile, I don't think it's terribly surprising that you don't change the overall lumbar lordosis um, because those other levels are adjusting. But I do think that by not fusing that segment in a flat position, at least giving them some lordosis, I don't have data to show this, although I'd like to eventually, that, that there may be some protective effect on the adjacent levels because you're not getting that hyper, you know, compensatory hyperlordosis above or something like that. Um, I, I do personally use uh, expandable cages for my T-lifts. Um, I think of it more of like a ship in a bottle so I'm not using it to create, I'm not using it to, you know, increase the disc height with the expansion or increase the lordosis. I, I use it because it's a small window to get it in. And then I fill the space with the expansion, um, which I think decreases subsidence and stuff like that. Curious to poll um, the other panelists here um, who uses um, expandable versus non-expandable T-lift cages for those of you who do a decent number of T-lifts. This, this is Jan, so uh, thanks for bringing that paper up. We actually, I'm not sure where this is. We have one or two of these projects going on. Um, one was actually presented at NAS, I think, last year. So in the lab, we could not find differences between the expandables and the non-expandables. We had an atomic comparison study. And uh, the, in our clinical study, similarly, we don't find any big differences. Now, I do like them for the same reasons that you mentioned. Um, it is something that allows a far smaller window with far less neural impingement uh, to be placed in a very strategic fashion. Uh, the, the thing, the learning point is that the precision of placement is so important. And again, you can fudge the data or uh, kind of blur the data either which way just by how you place the cage. Specifically, if you don't have purchase of your cages along the apophyseal end plate, um, your cage will subside. So if you put that into the center of a vertebral body end plate, the nicest expandable cage will still just sink into the body, even in a healthy bone. So, so the devil's in the detail and how you release the joints and how you realign the spine um, is uh, really in the operator's behold. So the variables are in the surgeon and not so much in the material. Um, and the main other thing is neural injury and dural tears, which I did not see in this comparison review as main factors for patient outcomes. Thank you. 
Hey, this is Blake Staub from TBI. Um, I, I agree with, with those points. I use an expandable cage simply because it's easier to get in, um, not necessarily for the lordosis alone, but I, I think lordosis, you have to consider carpentry here. Um, if you're trying to get lordosis through a segment, a T-lift will work, but you need to take the contralateral facet. Um, so I, I think unless you're kind of breaking that off as a separate subset in a paper, kind of combining just just putting in a bone graft is not going to give you lordosis. You've got to actually try and get lordosis. And I think that's what's missing in a lot of these papers is you're assuming that putting in an inner body graft is going to give you lordosis. But in reality, you have to actually do the carpentry uh, to get that lordosis. And uh, I agree, Peter, I agree with your assessment regarding the segmental lordosis. And I think the follow-up um, limitations of the study may not necessarily capture that. So be interesting um, with longer follow-up, whether or not that does convey a protective effect. Well, I think I, um, I, I think Peter brought up kind of the holy grail, which would be the rationale for using an expandable cage would be to decrease adjacent segment surgery, um, which there's no studies that have really shown that yet. Um, having said that, the, 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 the TLIFs, and I don't do that many, are usually on older patients that have contraindications to anterior spine surgery, which I think almost everybody would agree is a better inner body fusion for both fusion rate as well as um, restoration of lordosis. And I don't know that adjacent segment disease, if you're doing these on 70 year olds and 80 year olds for one or two level issues is, is, really, is really a problem. And plus you're not gonna get the long-term follow-up for obvious reasons. Yeah, but I think in other practices that, um, while I agree with you, I think other people, um, uh, TLIF is their go-to as opposed to where we feel of it um, as a surgery that's done when you can't do other operations. Well, and, and, and yeah, and that is true across the United States, but you know, if you think about it, a minimally invasive TLIF, what are you trying to do with these patients? Do most of them have stenosis? You can't really do a great decompression, MIS. Most of them, you know, need a fusion, and the space available to do an inner body fusion through, you know, a small exposure and an expandable cage, where well, you can't get a whole lot of bone graft into expandable cage because of the mechanism. Um, I, I just don't know that that you're doing a younger patient a service by doing MIST list for, you know, a diagnosis that other operations can do a better job at. Yeah, it goes back to carpentry. Bad surgery is bad surgery. Um, if you do a, a crummy disc prep, um, you're gonna not have a lot of fusions. If you do a good T-lift, the patient will fuse and do well. So I, I think just lopping everyone off into a category of, oh, T-lifts are bad because there are bad surgeons is, is not really No, I'm, I'm, saying, I'm saying they're bad because they're poorly thought out surgery, not, not poor surgeons, because you're trying will, to, to do something. I will take issue with one thing that you said, and I agree with almost everything, is that you can't get a de good decompression minimally invasively. Um, I get the same decompression through a tube that, that you can do open. Um, you just have to be, you know, be trained and, and good at doing it. But, but as far as the biomechanics and everything else, I, I totally agree. Okay, cool. Well, I think that uh, we should move on. Um, we're gonna go on to the next um, paper, which will be presented by Joe Albano. Joe, I'll let you set this one up. I'm muted, I was muted, sorry. Um, Joe Albano, another one of the Spine Fellows. That article and discussion is a nice segue into, the, uh, into my presentation, which focuses a little more granularly on some of the issues that we were just talking about. Um, so as, as we just kind of mentioned, we set this up well, MIS interbody fusions associated with the so-called flattening effect at the segmental level. Uh, so, and so there's been this trend that we were discussing towards more lordotic cages. Uh, the issue, again, ha as has been brought up, uh, is that MIS techniques uh, minimize the bony ligamentous resection and so therefore just inherently limit the amount of lordosis that you're able to attain. And so this study looked at just MIS techniques um, to see if uh, the, the cage angle uh, keeping everything else the same, did affect the segmental lordosis. So as a retrospective review, two reviewers uh, looked at the imaging, total of 98 patients, 116 levels, uh, all four degenerative conditions listed there. 
they looked at three procedures. They looked at tubular MIS T-lifts with a unilateral facetectomy for their T-lift. They looked at lateral interbody fusions with, uh, without ALL resection. And then they looked at uh, ALLs with the standard retroperitoneal approach. Um, all cases were selected for the maximum lordotic angle cage um, as long as it was not at risk of violating the end plates. And they tried to, to maintain the level as, as the, um, uh, the, the levels, uh, the adjacent levels. Uh, so they looked at a variety of patient demographic factors, uh, as well as all the, uh, the typical lumbar uh, uh, sagittal parameters. Uh, but the one really that they focused on was the index level segmental lordosis. And they measured that by measuring the angle between the inferior end plate uh, of the level above and the superior end plate of the vertebrae below. They looked at preoperative images and then their first, first postoperative images at two to six weeks with full length x-rays looking at that segmental um, uh, value. Uh, so they, they broke down the cage sizes into three categories. Uh, six to eight was the small size, 10 to 12 was the medium size and 15 to 20 was the large size. So a uh, uh, majority, as I'll show, of the cages in the TLIF uh, cohort were expandable between 8 and 15. And so if they were, uh, you know, kept at the 8 uh, position because the, the disc height didn't allow for more expansion than that, they were grouped into the small category. And, and uh, if they were maximally expanded to 15, then they were included in the 15 category. So the same cage could have, uh, in a different patient, could have been included in two different categories. And the same was true for the uh, lateral uh, fusion as well. So... Uh, just in terms of uh, uh, some of the results, L4-5 was the most common level uh, evaluated. Um, the 15 degree cage was the most common cage used. Uh, the vast majority of cages were appropriately placed anteriorly and by far uh, the most um, uh, significant number of cases uh, done were, were, the, were t lifts. Um, and then looking at the types of cage used in each procedure, you can see that for the T-lifts in all categories, uh, well, I guess, except for the middle category, the expandable cages were used more frequently. Um, whereas in the other two, two surgeries, the majority were, were static um, cages. So when broken down by surgery, what we see is that uh, there was significance in terms of um, segmental lordosis, but only with respect to the A-lift. Um, some thought was, uh, the, the thought was that it's because you, by nature of the surgery, you have to take down the ALL, ALL in the A-lift compared to the other surgeries and so therefore allow for anatomic uh, allotment of uh, increased lordosis. Um, when looking at it a little, a little more closely uh, in terms of which cages had um, significant changes, there, there weren't really any uh, angle of cages, uh, no significant change in terms of the, uh, the size of the cage that was used. So increasing the lordosis in that case does not increase the segmental lordosis of the level. Uh, what they did find was that in the L-lift category, only when the cage was maximally expanded to 15 degrees, there was a significant change of 4.5 plus or minus six uh, degrees of uh, a change in lordosis. Um, the other thing that did, that did have an effect was the position of the cage. As we know, the cages should be placed anteriorly um, for the sake of increasing the chance of lordosis. And that was borne out in this, in this research as well. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, in conclusion, uh, cage lordo the lordosis inherently of the cage is not going to increase the lordosis of the segment. And so it should not be relied upon. Things that do, as, as we kind of knew before, were, are the anterior approach and, and position uh, of the cage. Um, now this kind of contradicts some, some of the recent literature. There's a paper that's referenced in this paper by uh, Hong uh, that found that increasing segmental lordosis in T-lift cases uh, does increase, um, excuse me, increasing the, the uh, amount of lordosis in the cage does increase segmental lordosis. But this was done with bilateral facetectomies and, and in an open approach. And so you're allowed for more, um, um, more lordosis inherently. Another paper by Ketchin that they reference uh, looked at MIS T-lifts and they found a very minimal, maybe one degree of change of lordosis with increasing the, uh, the uh, lordosis of the case. So not significant there. The LF literature uh, does seem to show some consistency. Um, there is, uh, it has been shown by Sembrano uh, that uh, increasing the uh, height or the uh, lordotic angle of the cage does increase the lordosis of the of the uh, the level. So the, the overall conclusion is that when doing these cases from an MIS procedure, in whichever of those these three that we do, um, try to get the cage as anterior as possible, um, 
and uh, and take down the ALL in the case of the, even in the LF as well if possible. Some of the limitations of the study, it was certainly uh, underpowered. Um, for example, the ALL only had 12 cases. I think the uh, uh, LIF, uh, excuse me, the ALIF had 12 cases. The LIF had uh, about 37 people. Uh, the other issue with the study is that it was a relatively short follow-up and so it didn't really allow for a lot of time to show if, the, if these different expandable cages would allow for subsidence or, or different vari, uh, variable angle cages would allow for subsidence. Uh, it was just looked pre-op versus post-op with respect to uh, the change in segmental lordosis. Uh, there was no control. There, was no, there were no zero degree cases and, um, and this was a single surgeon and selection. I mean, notwithstanding all these um, these issues, I do think that it's an interesting, at least discussion starter and, and uh, cause for future research. So I'm curious what the panel thinks about uh, the findings in this study. Thanks, Joe. Um, so, you know, the, I think, as I, I agree with you, this brings up some interesting points. I think that the um, results here largely make sense. You know, there's only, there's only two ways to create lordosis. You either lengthen the front and or shorten the back. With a uh, MIST lift, if you're doing a unilateral facetectomy, you, you're not really doing either um, because you're not taking the ALL and, you, and you're not really doing a full release in the back. And, and same thing with uh, lateral intrabody fusion with perk screws. So it's not surprising that you know you can't just put a bigger wedge in there and expect something to happen. They didn't find that the the lordosis angle on the A lift was cor correlated with the segmental lordosis, which is the one point that I, that I think, you know, could be improved here. And I think that their inability to, the, the reason that they found that or didn't find that was they only had two hyperlordotic A-lift cages. In, in my experience, and, and I know some of my colleagues who, who hopefully will speak to theirs as well, you know, you can really, really substantially change someone's segmental lordosis with a hyperlordotic A-lift cage at at 5.1, you know, I routinely use 20, 25 degree cages. And if you use a big A-lift cage, um, that's what they get. They don't, they don't have a lot of subsidence. I think the anterior placement comment doesn't really apply to A-lift because, you know, A-lift, you want to fill the space. Um, and then interesting on lateral, I think that there's, there's two things that you're optimizing. One is your lordosis and putting an anterior cage makes sense. But if you're trying to get indirect decompression, perhaps you want it a little bit closer to the back because you want that posterior height um, near the disc space. So, so just some thoughts. Um, how about anyone else on the on the panel? What are your thoughts on uh, segmental lordosis, a lift, what you use, et cetera? Well, I think your point regarding uh, the underpowered uh, to capture the a lift. I mean, if you look, there was a trend, um, and you know, obviously, I think for this study, it made sense to group it. But, you know, there may actually, in fact, be a difference between using a 15 and a 20. And, you know, there are even people doing 30 degree A-lift cages. So I think um, while it brings up some interesting study uh, points, you know, this study um, is underpowered to capture some of the things that I think anecdotally we see on a daily basis with hyperlordotic A-lifts. Dr. Lieberman, I know you're not a fan of the hyperlordotic A-lift. Um, would you like to share your thoughts? Sure. Thanks, Peter. Uh, clearly, I'm biased by virtue of my revision practice. Uh, I see many hyperlordotic uh, cages being placed laterally and anteriorly, and I shouldn't be condemning the device, the implant, as much as the surgeon and the patient selection. Because uh, what I've found with the ones that I've had to revise, they're forced in and you get point contact and then subsiding. And they're not really addressing what was meant to be addressed. So I think it's more of a patient education, uh, not patient, a surgeon education uh, issue as to how to use the implants appropriately. Uh, I think your comment about lengthening the front, shortening the back is what you need to do. And I rely very heavily on multi-level A-lifts to regain lordosis. Uh, that's my, my mainstay, and much like the discussions on the uh, first paper, I use TLIF almost as a, a salvage if I've got someone who's just absolutely obese or had multiple anterior procedures and, and I just don't think I can get uh, good ALIFs done, I'll do a TLIF at L5S1 to get my foundation for that individual. And 
realize that I'm probably not going to get the amount of lordosis that I want to get out of that person. Thanks. All right. Well, um, good conversation. We got to move on to the next paper, um, which uh, Bobby Stockton is going to present. I thought this was a, a clever little paper that uh, Greg Mundus's group put out, and it's actually influenced my practice and in, in how I think. So take it away, Dr. Stockton. You may be muted. Stockton on. Bobby, you're muted. Lower left, uh, yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. That's bizarre. Sorry about that, guys. I'm Bobby Stockton. This is a journal, uh, article at a Global Spine Journal. Um, Dr. German did a nice introduction, and it is a very cleverly done article as well. So, a little background. Indirect decompression has become increasingly popular with the use of inner body devices. These devices lead to solid anterior column support, helping us restore sagittal balance and disc height. With this restoration of disc height, you, we get ligamentotaxis and we tension our annular fibers and our ligamentum flavum posteriorly, which helps increase our area in our canal and our neural foramen as well. So the question is, do we need to formally decompress at all posteriorly? And if not, who is a candidate for just indirect decompression alone? So the goal of the study was to evaluate the success of indirect decompression alone. And they chose to use preoperative rest pain as an indicator of success for isolated indirect decompression and hypothesize that lower levels of rest pain would be correlated with a greater likelihood of successful indirect decompression surgery alone. So this is a two surgeon single center retrospective chart review of uh, patients who underwent ALIF or LIF with posterior pedicle screw fixation um, between levels T12 and S1. They excluded um, all patients that underwent uh, direct decompression and uh, patients on, that went through revision surgery were not included, and uh, patients with no pre-op leg pain were not included as well. So they had a total of 70 patients, and they divided these patients into two groups um, based on their responses to ODI question number seven, which is the clever part of this article, I think. So um, question seven addresses patients' back and leg pain and the effect it has on their sleep. So um, if they had mild, uh, if they had no pain at sleeping, occasional disturbance, or less than um, six hours of sleep, they were included in group one. And the more severe patients were included in group two if their sleep was um, terribly disturbed. Um, and they compared the three-month post-op um, NRS leg and back scores between these two groups. So when comparing the two groups, um, group one and group two, there were no significant differences with respect to the demographic uh, data, including age, BMI, um, their neurogenic claudication, and the number of levels treated. Interestingly, um, preoperatively, the ODI scores were different. You would expect them to be the same if you're comparing two groups, but since we arranged the groups based off an ODI score, you would expect it to be different. So. Some people would think that's a bias. I don't think that's a bias in the study. The NRS back scores were different preoperatively, but they weren't so concerned about back pain as much as leg pain, and the leg scores were similar preoperatively, so that's uh, a good thing. Um, Postoperatively at three months, um, the NRS leg and back scores were significantly lower in group one after indirect decompression. Um, the patient's perceived percentage decrease in their leg and back symptoms was better in group one. And group one reached a minimal clinically important difference for leg pain more often than in group two as well. They also included a sub-analysis cohort of patients um, that had their uh, less than three levels fused and they were um, instrumented below L3. So the change in their three-month NRS leg and back scores remain significant um, in this sub-analysis cohort, as well as the perceived percentage decrease in the leg scores at three months. Um, no longer significant was the patient's perceived difference at three months, and none of the groups um, achieved a minimal clinically important difference for the leg and back scores. 
So from the data um, that was presented in the article, the uh, authors propose that preoperative assessment of resting pain level does have a significant association um, with patients' leg and back scores after undergoing indirect decompression for lumbar spinal stenosis. And they are leaning towards recommending that, uh, you know, open direct decompression is not necessary for all patients, especially if the patients have none or minimal leg pain at rest. Um, they did say that they're going to uh, do further prospective studies to evaluate the longevity of the indirect decompression since they only studied it at three months postoperatively. Um, and I think, interestingly, they include a lot of radiographic studies kind of to just um, emphasize that this indirect decompression does in fact have um, actual increases in mean foraminal area, central canal area, and um, subarticular diameter um, because they didn't include radiographic correlation with their clinical symptoms in their study. So some of the conclusions, it's a retrospective chart review. Um, it's a small sample size too. I think their data would probably be even better if their sample size was bigger. Um, they noted that there were differences in the pre-op ODI and NRS back pain, but I think that's, if you understand how the uh, how this study was designed, you would accept those differences. And um, the, they didn't have a uh, radiographic correlation with the clinical symptomology in their article, which is probably why they included so many radiographic citations in their discussion. So I think this is a tool that could be used. And I think the way that the article was designed um, could be applied even to, you know, a Texas back pretty easily because we take ODI on everybody. But um, I think we need a prospective study with a, lar a larger sample size and I think the data would be very, very positive. Thanks. So, you know, as I mentioned, I, I've started asking my patients routinely now if I'm considering indirect decompression, something that, you know, I do frequently, you know, not directly decompress them in the back if they have, if they have rest pain. And, you know, my limited and, you know, single surgeon sample size, it's, it's been pretty good. Interestingly, I looked at our data um, at TBI for our a -lift. So this was a uh, lateral study. I looked at a to see if this ODI question was predictive of failure of uh, indirect decompression um, and, and was not able to find a, a correlation there. However, I looked at return to the OR for a direct decompression as, um, as the definition of failure. Um, which might not be as sensitive um, as, as the measures they looked at here. Alternatively, you know, maybe we're looking at slightly different pathology, maybe more foraminal stenosis with an A-lift since a lot of them are at 5.1. Um, anyone else um, use something similar to this or, or what are your thoughts about uh, when you can get away with we, indirect? We've been doing the indirect decompression for degenerative spondings for years and years, as you well know, looking through the data. And uh, initially we were doing the indirect decompression from the front poster decompression and pedicle screws. And then when we would get in there from behind, we found that, you know, there really wasn't such bad uh, compression. So I almost never will do a direct decompression unless if the patient fails. And the number of failures is very, very small. And, and I don't know if Mike Heisey's on the line here, but uh, Mike and Dan Bradley started doing this, I don't know how many years ago, uh, where they weren't doing any posterior decompression. So it's a very, very effective technique. But for the fellows to understand that spinal stenosis occurs very, very slowly. And it's like, you know, the old saying, the silly millimeter makes a difference. Well, what happens is they get to a critical point where they then become symptomatic. I mean, they didn't just go from a 13 millimeter canal down to a six millimeter canal. So uh, by doing the indirect decompression, stretching the ligaments, you're increasing the central canal, open up the neuroframen. So you know, my bias, of course, is A-lift, not P-lift, but it's been very, very effective in our hands. Yeah, perfect. And, and the data that, that, we've, that we have shows that about 4% return to the operating room at some point for direct decompression, which means that 96% don't. So that, you know, that's how I counsel my patients. And there was a recent uh, lateral lumbar interbody fusion, which showed ex exactly the same uh, ret return to the OR failure rate. So... Very good. Let's move on to the next paper, uh, which is going to be presented by uh, Dan Curdley. 
Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Dan Caridley. I'm one of the spine surgery fellows at the Texas Back Institute, um, and I'll be presenting this study by Klingler et al. Uh, out of Germany on radiation exposure and minimally invasive lumbar fusion surgery, uh, a randomized controlled trial comparing conventional fluoroscopy and 3D fluoroscopy-based navigation. Um, so the minimally invasive T-lift procedure was initially described by Foley et al. in 2003. This technique uses smaller incisions and less soft tissue dissection to allow for lower blood loss and shorter hospital stays. In order to achieve this, the technique relies on fluoroscopy to guide the accurate placement of pedicle screws and rods, as well as the interbody device of choice. Therefore, the MIS T-lift results in greater radiation exposure to the surgeon and patient than an open procedure. The use of conventional 2D fluoroscopy and the use of 3D imaging based navigation are two different possible techniques to perform the MIS T-lift. The doses of radiation delivered to the surgeon, OR staff, and patient had not previously been compared between these two techniques, and that was the objective of this study. Um, so this study was a prospective randomized controlled trial uh, with surgery performed by a single surgeon at a single institution. Uh, patients were, uh, who were indicated for a monosegment MIS T-lift were randomized to navigation or fluoroscopy groups. Uh, the 3D imaging for navigation in this case was obtained using the Zeme uh, 3D C-arm device. Uh, radiation delivered to the patient was measured by dosimeters on the chest, thyroid, and gonads. Uh, the OR staff and surgeon, uh, in addition to having dosimeters at those locations, also had dosimeters uh, on the eyes, hands, and back as well as above and below the lead apron. Uh, the readings from these dosimeters were subtracted from uh, background radiation readings, which were obtained from dosimeters that were placed outside the operating room. Additionally, the overall fluoroscopy time and dose area product for each procedure was recorded. Um, so in table one to the right, you can see the inclusion and exclusion criteria for this study. Patients were at least 18 years of age with chronic low back pain, having failed at least three months of conservative treatment and having, valid, uh, and having a valid indication for TLIF, including degenerative disc disease, disease uh, and or instability with a grade one or two spondylolisthesis. Exclusion criteria included prior surgery at the index or adjacent level, scoliosis with a Cobb angle of over 10 degrees, and other conditions including vertebral body fracture, uh, grade three or four spondy, and neoplasm. Uh, table two below uh, shows that there's no difference between the randomized patient cohorts in terms of base baseline patient and disease characteristics. On the left, you can see that uh, 86 patients were enrolled in the study over a two-year period, uh, with 42 ex excluded based on the exclusion criteria, resulting in 44 patients available for randomization. Two patients in the fluoroscopy group and one patient in the navigation group did not undergo MIST lift due to equipment malfunction, resulting in 21 and 20 patients who had data analyzed respectively. Looking at the results, in table three on the left, we can see that there was a non-significant increase in radiation exposure to the surgical staff in the fluoroscopy group at the unprotected body parts. There was no difference in the protected areas of the body. The significant findings are highlighted in the red box, uh, and you can see that there was significantly increased radiation dose at all locations uh, measured on the patient in the navigation group there was also significantly greater overall radiation delivered to, in the navigation group. Um, these findings uh, are graphically presented on the right in figures two and three by box and whisker plots. Uh, so to summarize, this study found uh, greater radiation doses to the surgeon with fluoroscopy, but this was not significant and did not occur with lead protection. Radiation delivered to the patient was significantly higher with navigation, but overall the radiation doses experienced in this study are low. Uh, based on the unprotected uh, doses delivered to the eyes, which were the highest doses seen in this study, a surgeon would need to perform over 500 MIS T-lifts a year using either technique to reach the ICRP recommended minimum annual exposure. 
For the patient, the, man, the maximal exposure in this study in the navigation group at the gonads is still below the average annual background radiation exposure that we all experience. Therefore, uh, I don't think that the difference in radiation doses between these two techniques is likely to tip the scale towards either technique. Some of the limitations of this study are that the radiation levels in typical cases may be higher than those in this study um, where they used a careful protective protocol. Um, additionally, uh, the fact that this study only looked at single level T lifts and used a C arm based navigation uh, makes its findings less generalizable. I found a similar study by Chang et al, which I would recommend reading if you're interested in this topic. Um, but in short, it retrospectively examined MIS T-lift radiation delivered between O-arm navigation and 2D fluoroscopy and found higher doses delivered to the patient with navigation for one level procedures. Uh, but interestingly, it found equivalent uh, radiation exposure to the patient for procedures of two or more levels or in obese patients uh, with lower doses delivered to the surgeon and staff with fluoroscopy um, for those uh, two level cases or in obese patients. All right, thanks, Dan. Um, I think there's, a, well, I know there's a variety of uh, NAV users versus non-NAV users in our practice. Um, I personally don't use NAV very frequently. I'd be curious in this article, you know, where the radiation was coming from, from those using the NAV. Um, were, they, were they taking spot films during the T-lift placement or what? I, I wish they would have gone into that a little further. It does seem like it was a little bit underpowered to show the difference. Um, Blake Staub, I know that you use um, OR navigation frequently um, for all your instrumented cases. I'm curious about what you do for the placement of your T-lift cage. Are you taking live spot films or are you just using the navigation the whole time? Uh, yeah, I take spot films. I use the navigation to, to make sure I get across the disc space. I'll take the pointer in there and make sure I'm on the other side. Um, you know, make sure I'm up all the way to the front. Uh, but I do take a couple spot films with the fluoro just to confirm. Uh, there are some navigated um, insertion tools uh, that help with that um, if you want to strictly use NAV. Um, yeah, I, I don't think there's any arguing that using NAV for a one-level T-lift, you're going to use more radiation than if you just do fluoro. Uh, but my point with navigation is if you use it for every case, it becomes standard. And for the tough case, it makes it easy. If you only use navigation for the tough case, it's going to make that tough case tougher. Um, so it's just kind of my workflow at this point. And then Dr. Lieberman, I know you use the robot. What are your thoughts on radiation exposure for the robot versus per se navigation? Do you think it's about the same? No, the, uh, the radiation exposure with the various uh, robotic guided technologies as opposed to the robotic navigated technologies, you've got to remember that distinction, uh, is clearly much less because you only need an AP and an oblique uh, image to register instead of a CT spin. And you can re-register with another AP and oblique image after your implantation. Uh, so you effectively got four fluoroscopic images instead of two C-arm spins. Uh, and it's pretty obvious where the, the radiation is gonna be. Uh, when you're doing the, the T-lifts, uh, the guided approaches I think are going to be an advantage. There, there's, there's no doubt as Blake pointed out, you can tell where you are and that's just another tool uh, that gives it to you. And quite frankly, the cost of extra radiation uh, may be worth it, especially when we start talking about getting the carpentry done right, getting lordotic cages, getting your correction done right. You want to place them uh, perfectly. Uh, so if you've got a tool that can help you with that and it costs a little radiation, so be it. Well, if nothing else, this paper showed that as a fluoro user, hopefully, uh, you know, I won't glow in the dark uh, at the end of my career. It seems like even using fluoro um, keeps you below some threshold, although there's probably no safe degree of radiation that we suck up. Let's get to our last case, our last paper um, that's going to be uh, presented by Dave Barnes. I couldn't uh, let us have a uh, MIS Journal Club without talking about a subject that's near and dear to my heart now, which is endoscopic spine surgery. Okay, thanks Dr. Derman. So this is a systemic, systematic review and superiority analysis from the Global Spine Journal in 2020. Um, let's see, there it goes. 
Some quick background. So the history of endoscopic spine surgery is relatively brief. Uh, the first iteration of, of this was done by Camden in 1973, which was actually a percutaneous non-visualized indirect spinal canal decompression. Uh, working cannulas were introduced a decade later. And then over the last few decades, uh, instrumentation and techniques and, and, and technology has advanced quite a bit and has shifted from an inside out technique to an outside in technique. Um, all of this has led to not only, to, led to uh, not only improve surgeon experience, but improve patient outcomes due to these factors. Endoscopic discectomy is becoming more widely adopted as a safe an effective alternative to traditional open uh, microdiscectomy. So the objective of this uh, article was to comprehensively analyze whether endoscopic discectomy shows superiority compared with open microdiscectomy in the management of lumbar disc disease. So uh, two reviewers performed an independent electronic literature search. Uh, the inclusion criteria included patients with lumbar disc disease with intervention of endoscopic discectomy, comparison group of uh, open microdisc, and then uh, these outcome measures. Exclusions were uh, non-endoscopic procedures, literature comparison group, uh, animal models, and anatomic studies. So there was uh, 27 studies included in this, uh, this review, including over 4,000 patients, 11 randomized control trials, seven uh, non-randomized pr prospective uh, 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 studies as well. So the, uh, here's a list of all the articles included. The first earliest article was from 1993 from Germany. Uh, most of the articles were from outside the US with only one being from the US in 1999. So uh, they, um, there was significant differences between the studies. So results of similar studies types were compared and analyzed um, for significant differences. So the main outcomes Sorry, not sure why it's not advancing. Hmm. There, okay. Well, so the uh, main primary outcomes for so in vast score, there's no no significant reduction in randomized control trials or non-randomized trials. There was significant reduction in retrospective. Um, uh, studies, leg pain, there's no significant difference in any study. And ODI, endoscopic, has significant reduction with uh, randomized control trials and retrospective studies. With the McNabb classification, clinical success was judged by excellent or good results, and there's so, no significant difference in any study type. Secondary outcomes, overall complication rate, there was no difference except for a significant reduction in randomized control trials. There was no difference in recurrence rate and no difference in reoperation rate. Uh, there was a significant decrease in randomized controlled trials and retrospective studies with duration of surgery, uh, length of stay was significantly less, and also a decreased time to return to work um, in retrospective studies. So main findings, uh, and this was considering randomized controlled trials exclusively. There was non-inferiority with vast back and leg pain, uh, McNabb classification, recurrences, reoperations, return to work, and superiority was established for endoscopic discectomy versus microdisc with ODI, duration of surgery, overall complication rate, and length of hospital stay. So this was the largest uh, uh, of all meta-analysis done to, to date. Um, the, their the author's conclusion was the endoscopic discectomy has the potential to take over the place of microdiscectomy as the gold standard of care in the management of lumbar disc disease. Uh, other uh, literature does show uh, a trend in this as well, but there's no clear cut uh, superiority in, in the current uh, literature as well. And so uh, some limitations, there was significant differences among the outcome measures in the studies. So individual results were stratified based on study design. So the overall conclusions were only based on randomized controlled trials, which only included about 26% of the total patients included in this um, systematic review. Uh, so the, also the length of stay was significantly long in, in both study groups. So I'm not sure how much weight can be placed on that. Uh, there's also a, probably a, most likely a large vari variability between 
uh, not only our surgical expertise and, and techniques, but uh, if you look at the years of publications, 26 years between the first and last article published, and we know that technology had advanced quite a bit since that time. So questions are, uh, will endoscopic discectomy surpass microdisc as the gold standard for treatment of lumbar disc disease? And how will future advancements improve surgery and experience patient outcomes and lead to expanded indications for, my, for uh, endoscopic discectomy? And uh, how do patients demand for more minimally invasive procedures drive the adoption of endoscopic techniques and how do surgeons manage those expectations? Thanks, Dave. Well, I think that the, um, you bring up some great points. I think that the kind of take home point of this article um, is kind of intuitive that, you know, if you're, if you're indicating your patients correctly and, and you have good technique with these endoscopic techniques, you're really doing essentially the same surgery um, that you would be doing through a microdiscectomy or an open discectomy, um, but you're doing it with uh, a technique that's more friendly to this surrounding soft tissue. So, you know, most of your outcomes are going to be very similar because it's the same surgery, but perhaps a little bit um, less back related disability. So ODI scores were improved compared to the other um, techniques. Um, Dr. Dr. Geyer and Dr. Heise, I know that you both have experience with, with endoscopy kind of at various stages along the way. I'm curious if you could speak to kind of the history of where this has come from and, and the changes that you see now. Well, thank you, Peter. I was fortunate enough and I'm old enough to have worked with Parvis Canvin. And uh, when we did it back then, it was like the old knee scope. You were looking through the... Uh, you know, through the scope itself, and we used to do a biportal technique, and the instruments were really, really primitive. So it's made tremendous advancement, but, you know, I'm talking almost 40 years ago that I worked with him, and, um, but the, what you have today is far superior. The problem is it still is very different looking anatomy, but I think like yourself and a lot of the other young surgeon, this will gradually uh, become, the, as you say, the, the gold standard, not yet. There's a lot of old, older surgeons, myself, and even younger than myself that, you know, don't want to change. And they say, hey, look, I can do it through a small incision and I can do well. My biggest fear, though, I'm, very honestly, it's not so much with this not taking off. It's with the interventionalists, the non-operative surgeons getting into this and then seeing, you know, maybe some good results and a lot of bad results. That's my real concern. I think this will be the state of the art in the future, Peter. And I, I congratulate you for taking this on because you started... As a, as a novice, and now you're pretty damn good at it. Hey, can I ask Peter, can you make a comment on learning curve? Sure, yeah, good question. So the learning curve um, for tubular decompressions, um, as well as now endoscopic decompressions has actually been pretty well documented in the literature. Um, in end endoscopy, the, the learning curve is about 30 to 50 cases. But interestingly, if you look at what the learning curve is, it's more about operative time than complications. And for me, that's a very important distinction. So, you know, by adopting these techniques early on, you're not putting your patients at risk. So you can still do these procedures safely. It's just going to take you a little bit longer. And, and what you find is that very rapidly your operative times come down um, so that they're either on par with or potentially faster than, than doing an open case. Um, but it is 30 to 50 cases. And, and I think that's a big hurdle, especially for established surgeons thinking like, oh my gosh, you know, I, I can do this micro disc in 45 minutes or for the next 30 to 50 cases, I can struggle through, um, you know, doing it endoscopically until I'm, until I'm really fast. Peter, I, I think the major problem, I don't think it's really that it's the number of cases. I think it's getting used to the anatomy because you're looking at it differently. You're looking through angle optics. And I think that much like MRI scans, the more you see and the, you, the more you put in your computer bank in your brain, uh, the better you get. And that's why I think for the fellows, if you look at the, a lot of the videos and, you know, uh, uh, what's his name, Young used to do this all the time, show all his videos, and much like you do. That's how you get used to the anatomy because it's totally different looking than what we're used to open. I totally agree. You know, my first case, my first endoscopic case I ever did was a chip shot 5-1 paracentral disc herniation that took me three and a half hours. Um, and that's because I wasn't used to looking at things in like all this great magnified detail. I think I spent 45 minutes looking at this thing. I was worried it was the traversing nerve root and it was a tiny little epidural vein. Um, but until you get used to how things look, it, you're, you're exactly right. It, it, 
it's slower, and, but eventually you do. The other thing is transforaminal approaches. Most spine surgeons aren't used to, you know, working around outside in, in the foramen, even, you know, getting into the lateral recess into the midline through, outside in through the foramen. So, so getting used to that orientation certainly is a part of it as well. Peter, the evolution of surgical technique, you know, the dinosaurs here remember, you know, as a, as a young orthopedic resident, we did knee arthrotomies for meniscal injuries, and the guys were struggling to learn the arthroscopic technique. When I was a general surgery resident, I was the second guy holding the, gall, holding the liver on an open cholecystectomy, and then I saw a young guy start to come into the community, and the older guys were threatened because they recognized that they were losing touch, they were out of it if they didn't adapt. So this is just the nature of surgical evolutionary technique. And you know, you're at a wonderful um, stage of something that will very clearly become uh, what everybody's gonna wanna have done to themselves. So- uh, yeah, and, and I think the technology is now here where it can really take off, Peter. And I think okay. we're seeing more and more folks embrace it. So, yeah. for, the fellows, so older, for the fellows, you need to learn this. So somebody older, wiser, and much better looking has to rain on this uh, parade of endoscopy. So uh, I'm speaking about myself. Don't laugh like that, Rich. So, so, <laughs> and I'm old enough to have seen uh, Scott Blumenthal suction out disc with a percutaneous uh, endosco uh, 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 discectomizer. So I remember that distinctly. We, we were looking at volume. Remember that, Scott? Oh, so, yeah. <laughs> so so uh, the key thing um, for me is commodities. So um, uh, ultimately, um, the success of endoscopy will be measured by its economic sustainability. And right now, for instance, our healthcare system is in that uh, panel that decides on technologies. We can't afford it. If a patient is willing to pay a differential, they can have it. But uh, the surcharges uh, of disposables, which is still the magic word for massive profit margins in American medicine next to biologics, the disposables are so prohibitive that the the margins are simply not there. So uh, b between that and the longer time increment it takes in, for instance, outpatient surgery centers, um, uh, the the foundations for a mass utilization are not there at this point in time. And I'm not even talking about the all the mist decompressions and resected pars and dural erosions and things like that. So, so for me, that's the single biggest struggle right now is how to create a foundation where within the next 20 years, we will be completely overwhelmed as spine surgeons uh, with, uh, like a British system, a massive uh, baby boomers like myself needing their spines decompressed. So I'd be curious to hear the economics of this addressed uh, in terms of how you want to make this operationally uh, survivable. Uh, very good points. Um, certainly the uh, disposable cost is very important and, and you're exactly right that some of the disposables are quite expensive. There are ways as you get more um, facile with these to avoid using a lot of those disposable items. Um, and there are companies that will sell reusable um, items that, that are not disposable. Um, so I think that there are good ways to keep the costs down on this. I think, you know, there's different ways to think about cost effectiveness. There's the cost of the surgery itself, um, but then there's, you know, lost work, et cetera. Uh, and, and I think that, you know, having a spine surgery one day and then going back to work the next day has value as well. Um, but, you know, all these things need to be borne out in the literature. Um, Peter, you brought up earlier uh, the concept of not necessarily increased complications, but increased time. Do you think there's any morbidity associated with that, with these procedures? Um, you know, it's, it's increased, um, you know, anesthesia time. So, you know, if you're worried that your patient's going to have an anesthesia complication, it's probably not one that you want to do early on. But, um, you know, surgical complications, um, that has not borne out in the literature. The other thing is, you know, this, this meta-analysis shows that, you know, the, the op time was actually less. So I assume these were experienced surgeons. And once they got over the learning curve, their operative time was statistically significantly less in a, in a meta-analysis. So anyway, I think we're running out of time, guys. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining me. I could talk about this stuff all day, every day. Um, and I'm glad to bring you guys along with me. Thank you, Peter. Right. Great job, Peter. Yeah. Love Love Peter. Thank you. And Thanks, thank Seattle. You Hello. Have All right. a good weekend, everybody. Stay healthy. See you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. Peter, I want to ask you a question offline. 
Sure, you want me to call you? Uh, well, actually, stay on here for just a second. Okay. Peter, do you use general all the time? So I'm transitioning to awake with local. Okay, um, that's how we used to do it with Canvin. We, but I wanted... Know, we would I, get my visitation and then just a little bit of local at the annulus. I just, I actually had my first awake one coming up. I wanted to make sure that my operative time. Thanks for watching. Hit the subscribe button for more medical content.